Welcome back to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie, where we believe an experience becomes truth. Joining us is our co-host, Well Benali, and UBN radio host, Demona Hoffman. Thank you for supporting our sponsors, Conscious Life Expo, by going to ConsciousLifeExpo.com to get your tickets for their February 2015 event. And take your mind on a literary journey by traveling over to AdventuresUnlimitedPress.com where you can purchase many of the books from our famed experts featured right here on Truth Be Told. In our first hour, we talked with author, ghost hunter, and Emmy-nominated TV host Jeff Ballinger about his journey into the field of paranormal research. But in this hour, we'll travel to our nation's thoroughfares to discover the most haunted sites along Route 66. I'm Demona Hoffman, and having investigated some of the country's most notorious haunted places as the executive in charge of Ghost Hunters and many of the Sci-Fi Channel's other paranormal shows, I'm excited to hear Richard discuss the art of ghost hunting. And how to approach a haunted location to ensure that you have a successful outcome. So let's get right to it and welcome author and ghost hunter Richard Southall. Yay! We're back. Hey Richard, how you doing? I am good. How are you doing? We're good. We're good. Well, we're excited to have you here. You know, we just uh, talked with Jeff uh, Bellinger about his experiences and how he got to become a ghost hunter. Now it's your turn, so you're under the knife. <laughs> uh, well, thank I know. Well, thank you for you know taking the time and and uh, spending an hour with us. And uh, first of all, ghost hunting. You know, it, it seems like it could be very easy and very scary. But uh, it's always interesting to find out how one becomes a ghost hunter. And so let's go back to when you were a young child and uh, find out when you first experienced the first ghost encounter. Mm -hmm. And then did that inspire you to become a ghost hunter? It absolutely did. Um, I lived in a small town not far from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in the 1980s. Um, My family and I had moved into a small farmhouse and shortly after we moved in we started noticing things um we started noticing things disappearing we started hearing sounds as if somebody's uh, walking down the steps at first i thought it was my brother that was just playing a prank on me but we were watching tv one night and we started hearing the footsteps coming down the, the steps and the, the stairway and we looked at each other and realized we actually were in a haunted house. Oh. So that's that's how it got started for me. And then I shared my experience with a few friends, and we started to talk to some of our neighbors and just wanted to find out more about them and about any of the hauntings they may have experienced. But what really, what really was the icing on the cake was Point Pleasant, the uh, site of the Mothman back in the oh, 1960s. Yeah. Um, John Gill. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I had a pleasure of them one time, but that, that's, that's really how it got started. And then from that point on, I started doing ghost hunting. Well, how, how does one, let's say, how did, how, did, how did you begin to ghost hunt? Because, there, you know, there, it's so technical now with all the equipment and stuff. How did you start as a ghost, hunt, ghost hunter? Well, sometimes the older ways, I think, are the better ways. <laughs> Whenever I found a place... Um, that we suspected of being haunted. Um, you know, after speaking to some of the people that may have lived there, may have experienced some of the um, paranormal activity, we did research. We simply went to the library, went to the newspaper archives, and did research on the house so that whenever we did do a more thorough investigation, we knew who it might be that we were speaking with. We knew what may have happened at that point. And just, we took it from there. We decided to take a very methodical approach. Just, you know, I didn't want, even back then, this was before the reality shows, this was before, um, the actual was in the 1980s. So that being the case, yeah, I've been doing it for a little while. So, and then once that, once I did that, I ended up going to college and found some people that were like-minded and we continued to do our paranormal investigations, and, and after discussing it for a while, we realized there weren't many books on the topic on how to accurately and, and thoroughly do a paranormal investigation, so what I did was I wrote How to Be a Ghost Hunter. Hmm. So. 
So <laughs> when you, when you write a, a, go, a how to be a ghost hunter, you know, like you said back back then, you know it's changed so much, and we didn't have the, all the reality shows. Uh, and especially in those days, uh, it was looked uh, at differently. Uh, uh, you know, li- oh, yeah, yeah it, it was, was like it was not. I the... was very nerdy when I was <laughs> <laughs> doing this in high school and college. It yeah. was so unheard of. Yeah, people well, nowadays are so fascinated about. It. Back then, it was like you're cr- they're crazy. Well, and, <laughs> yeah. and then back then, there was not the social media to back it up. You didn't have those other little <laughs> private communities you could yeah. tap into like you can now. But Richard, you were also kind of in the bible belt a little bit and so i would imagine Mm -hmm. that sort of ruffled some feathers and so what about the skeptics back when your first book came out about ghost hunting and how to do it Mm. well i did get some um emails about that and actually some phone calls and overall it was fairly positive i didn't really get anything negative i think the audience that i was writing for they were very open to the paranormal. Um, as for the Bible Belt, so to speak, I, yeah, I may have gotten some contact, but nothing, nothing to, to speak of, nothing that, that really stands out. Good. And it seems like in the Bible Belt, there's a lot. Seems like a lot of haunted places anyway. So that that, that kind of find mm-hmm. that fascinating. There, there, there's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So again, as a ghost hunter, uh, with with the way technology has changed, when when did you start? or have you started kind of going in that direction of buying the equipment or do you still do just the old school method? I do a combination. I still go ahead and do the old school method. I think that about 80% of the paranormal investigation should not necessarily be on site. I think that we need to be prepared beforehand interviewing eyewitnesses, Mm -hmm. doing research on the history of the place before we even that foot inside of a haunted location. That's where the that's where we get the tech and put that out. We get the the voice recorders, the, the camcorders, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think we all, whenever we do an investigation like that, we need to know how to properly use the equipment. So uh, it's a combination. I I am going a little bit tech. So, <laughs> and I think for me. I, I, as when we watch a lot of these television shows and Demona has worked on shows like this, uh, and you might even be able to answer some of this because we had talked a little bit about, about this with Jeff about the, the amount of time, because sometimes ghosts are not always present. And so if people go in to do ghost hunting in just a three or four day shoot or th- three or four days One worth night. of ghost hunting yeah. mm-hmm. and they're like, Oh, I don't see anything. I don't have any proof. Well, sometimes it's not going to just come out and go boo mm-hmm. <laughs> how i mean do you yeah. think there's a length of time that one needs to investigate what i did whenever i did an investigation it wasn't just going into the house just once mm-hmm. i would make several trips um sometimes it would take weeks and actually in many cases before we really even got an evp or any kind of apparition on film it would take maybe eight nine weeks before we actually found anything that wow. was concrete. Now, we may have had some, some whispers. We may have had something that could have been an EVP, but before we got something concrete, it took several several visits. And may I ask what, just for our audience, what EVP means? Okay, electronic voice phenomenon. Um, absolutely, it's just, that's one of my favorites. I mean, what I do is I use a, um, well, I get a tape recorder, not a tape recorder, I'm that's old school. <laughs> I use a, a voice recorder, and I end up uh, asking questions. And just like most of the people here that are listening to the show, they, they pretty much know how to do a voice recording. Um, but sometimes if you play it back, especially on, on some of the computer programs we've got now, you can absolutely hear hear voices, you can hear sounds, you can hear sometimes names. Um, one of the most pronounced EVPs I picked up was not too far from where I live. There's a place called Flinderation Tunnel. And I had visited there several times. It was part of the B&O Railroad. I was a thousand-foot tunnel. I actually had a cemetery on top of it. So hmm. very creepy place, but I loved it. <laughs> anyway, after <laughs> it was is the season, right? Right, right, mm-hmm. but, <laughs> yes. But there are even purists but who in, say you can't, that you shouldn't even use digital. Some people 
say if it's not tape, like it could be tampered with. And I think that's like one of the, the challenges with so many shows being out there and everybody's looking to poke holes and looking for the, right. the fakery that sometimes I think people miss the experience when they go out on their own because they're, you know, they're, they're trying to, to, to follow a certain protocol that doesn't really, you know, doesn't really line up with, with what you're actually going to find. Right. I agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that being the case, what I would, yes, I have a certain protocol that I, I follow. However, you've got to be able to fine tune it for the particular location. Mm -hmm. One particular type of haunting may not necessarily require a certain a certain technique of interviewing or a certain type of photography, um, so on and so forth. It depends on the individual location. Mm hmm. Have you ever had a a, a ghost or an entity ever follow you home? No, but I do know that there is a definite difference between a ghost and an entity. Well, that's, um, oh, yeah. yeah let's talk about that. that. Yeah, tell us the difference so that uh, the audience understands. Okay. Pretty much I divide all the paranormal experiences into one of three categories. We've got ghosts, we've got spirits, and we've got entities. Ghosts are simply recordings that something very traumatic happened or if something was repetitious over an extended length of time that leaves an impression and it tends to play back on occasion. Spirit, on the other hand, it could be an individual that may have unfinished business, they may have died unexpectedly, or they may have a very strong emotional connection to a location. So that one you can probably make contact with. Would that spirit also be, Richard, could that spirit have unfinished business with a location as well as a person? Absolutely, yes. I've, I've known of cases where a person who had a loved one die moved to different locations, actually in a different state. Hmm. Um, and it turns out that the spirit followed them. So, wow. You can it's run, not, but you can't hide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then entities? Entity is um, neither the ghost or the spirit. It's something that's a little bit darker that, well, it's on a different plane. It's just what most people would call angels or demons. So if you want to think of it that way. So entities, very, very, very rare. I am, actually, I've not really had much experience with that at all. Spirits. Yeah. More common, but the most most frequently experienced paranormal paranormal activity would be the ghost, would be the the recordings, if you will. So, so uh, let me go backwards just a second. You were talking about the EVP. So, what was I think you were going to tell us what came through your EVP that was one of the most distinct ones you had ever experienced? Well, I was there with with two friends. We were doing this. Um, small EVP session in the tunnel. We didn't hear anything whenever we actually were there. When we came back and we put it into the computer, listened to it, you can very distinctly hear the words, I see her. Now, there were two guys and one mm. lady with us. So, oh. Yeah. Mm. So you could very distinctly hear that. But who that knows? That could have been a ghost, and maybe that was a replay of something else that happened. Could that have been a ghost and or spirit guide or spirit or angel, if you will? I'm, I'm not certain, but it was the clearest EVP I have ever heard. How, what would so I, was a, I was a good 25, maybe 30 feet from the voice recorder. Nobody was nearby. Well, and I think the thing that's important to um, say about EVP is that y this is not something you're hearing with your, your ears. Yeah, the naked ear. This is something that in the moment is not there, and then you play it back on the recording, and it is there. Right. That's why it's a phenomenon. Y you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're so smart. Uh, <laughs> so, Richard, have you ever had the regular tape recorder in there with the EVP equipment? So you're covering both your bases. You're a little old school. You're a little new school. And then the voice <laughs> picks up. Maybe sometimes on a tape recorder, a high-frequency uh, audio like that might not be picked up on a tape recorder. Voice is the EVP and or the other way around, right? Yeah, 
It's just the recording. Well, record. I don't think one person should rely entirely on one piece of equipment. There mm -hmm. have been times when I have used a micro cassette recorder in addition to the voice recorder. And it's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have I'd rather have two types of technology, you know, as pretty much you know, so I can get some additional perspective on things. As hmm. you said, sometimes you can pick up things on on tape that you wouldn't necessarily be able to on a um, on a voice recorder. You know, I had an experience um, right after my best friend passed away. He died in 1993. And so I changed his room that was in my house into my office and started doing psychic work out of it. And uh, just before I moved the changed the office out, I was in there in the bed talking to a client in Kentucky. I was in North Carolina. It's when remote phones came out. You know, you had that big antenna that mm -hmm. you could use as a sword. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd been on the no, phone with him. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm just now laying on the bed. Um, and this is a very difficult person I'm talking to. He just wants proof, 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 but only from one person. So all of his dead relatives had lined up. They're all talking. He's like, yep, that's my grandma, but that's not who I want to talk to. And I'm like, and then he's like, that's my great uncle, but that's not who I want to talk to. So we do this for an hour and I'm getting frustrated. He's getting frustrated. And now I'm just laying back on the bed, listening to him chatter away. And I said, well, who is it you're looking for? He said, I'm not going to tell you who I'm looking for. I just want you to tell me if they're there. And my best friend's name was Tim. The guy I was talking to's name was Tim. The guy he wanted to hear from in spirit who had passed away, who was his boyfriend, was Tim. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there on the bed Tim in Tim's old room. A month or so after <laughs> Tim had died, talking to Tim in Kentucky, and this truly happened. We're sitting on the phone. I wasn't speaking. He didn't say anything. The phone got crackly and then a little static, and I swear, and then it came through and went, Tim, and then the static, and then we, I bolted up out of the bed, and he's like, did you effing hear that? <laughs> and I'm like, well, who the F do you want to talk to? And he's like, Tim. So his lover's name was Tim. So Tim broke through. My Tim broke through with his Tim to tell Tim to shut the F up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was when the new, it was when the remote phones it. first came out. And I mean, that was a life changer for me. That was a game changer. Wow. Made, it made him a believer too. <laughs> oh yeah. And then I changed the sheets and went about my day. <laughs> right. So how, so what's the biggest mistake, Richard, that people make when they start doing yeah. their own ghost hunting? Well, they don't do research. I mean, we've got different types of paranormal investigators. We've got the ones who are truly investigating. Then we've got the thrill seekers. They, the people that I call the thrill seekers, they go into an area, be it an abandoned house or cemetery or whatever, just for something to do. I mean, they have no idea what they're getting into. They don't know anything about the history. They're not taking safety precautions. They're doing it because they think it's cool rather than going in methodically. Mm. I think that would be the biggest mistake, in my opinion. What are some of these safety precautions that you feel people should be taking? Great question. Well, I just need to know because, <laughs> I mean, I don't want these ghosts following like me Like when you're done playing with the Ouija board, you got to say bye or that bitch going to follow you home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I probably wouldn't take a Ouija board. No. <laughs> Yo, anyway. Yeah. No. Okay. So yeah, anyway, so what, what I would do is definitely let somebody know that you're going. You know. This is uh, just like dating. <laughs> right. What's that? This is just like dating. Just tell someone you're going. <laughs> so if you don't yeah. come back, yeah. they know to send a search party. <laughs> but right. I mean, that's also good. That's also good, Richard, for safety reasons, because, you know, it, even if you don't have a paranormal experience, you're going into these dark places, sometimes abandoned. You don't know what you're going to find in mm, there. That's true. And there's there's real dangers in some yep. of these locations. Mm -hmm. Imagine a paranormal investigation as the first date, too. That would make things <laughs> I tried to. It's I, I, I was <laughs> going to say, like, yeah, a date with the dead. I tried to bring my worlds together many times. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, let, okay, so tell someone where you're going. Yeah. What else? Get permission. 
Good for mission. Oh. Um, yeah. Especially in older places, the owner needs to know that you're that somebody's going to be there. Otherwise, you're trespassing, and bad things can happen. Mm-hmm. Instead of being a ghost hunter, we could become ghosts. <laughs> right. <laughs> And give mm-hmm. us one more, because we were dying to ask you about these haunted plantations. Oh, man, we'll, we'll get to that. But, yeah, I'd say make sure that your equipment is um, is working properly. Um, make certain that you don't go alone. I, I usually, like, whenever I do an investigation, have at least three people. Hmm. I, myself, if I hear something, I may jump to conclusions. If I hear... If another person goes with me, we may scare each other. You know, just, did you hear that? Yeah. You know, just go into that. But if we have a third person there, then we can have independent verification that we, in fact, saw something or we, mm-hmm. in fact, heard something. That if makes that sense makes to any me. sense. Now, do you think, Do you? and I know this may sound silly to some, but do you think, do you try to ask permission from the from the ghost, from the ghost or spirit, the spirit or entity as you go into the into the location absolutely we're going into their territory we're going to absolutely into their territory i think we should out of respect ask, you know just ask permission to or at least introduce yourself tell them why you're there especially if you've got a spirit a spirit again is a person who may not even realize they're dead Oh, yeah. So that could that could make some interesting experiences for both us and them. <laughs> um, yeah, we need to we need to absolutely ask their permission. Now, one thing back to the whole EVP thing. One thing that I really have re- oh how can I phrase it? I lost my train of thought. Is that if I want a high chance of getting an EVP, not only would I ask questions. To especially naming the person who likely died there, where I learned from doing independent research before going on site, that I would bring an MP3 player with a speaker, Bluetooth preferably, hmm. playing music from that era. Oh, that's somebody, smart. That is yeah, smart. Say if we had somebody that died in the 20s, and we got a name, and we know how they died, what I would do... I would download some music that was popular during the 20s mm. and play it. That stirs things up, and it increases the chances of getting an EVP. Mm. Mm. You know, Richard, I also I worked on Ghost Hunters Academy, and we were dealing with novice ghost hunters that were, were trying to learn how to do it. Hey, thanks. Mm. <laughs> um, so... One thing that I saw a lot, too, is that people, when they do go in and start asking questions, they don't leave enough time for a response. They just start pummeling questions, and it's like not waiting for a conversation, but also not realizing that to to say a question and pause and wait, this takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And we edit it down to an hour, but, you know, that's a one, two, three-day investigation. So what? how do you get those people that are new to it to develop the patience and the discipline to be a ghost hunter? What I do is I would, ask, well, I'd come up with a list of questions before I even went on site. And when I would ask a question, I would wait 30 seconds to a minute before I'd ask another question. Yeah, yeah. Again, like you had said, that there is a pause. It's not going to be a conversation like you and I are having. It's going to be drawn out. And a lot of people, they get impatient. So... Mm -hmm. I think it's crucial that, if nothing else, becoming a ghost hunter, you learn a great deal of patience. Mm -hmm. Well, then the other part of that, you have to listen to all of that. You have to listen (laughs) to it all back. Oh, I know. (laughs) Hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And if you're just tuning in, you're listening to UBN Radio's On Air with Tony Street's exclusive Truth Be Told show. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Eddie Connor. Demona Hoffman. And we have live with us on the phone Richard Southall. And he is talking to us about all of his paranormal experiences. We would love to know your most scary, the thing that scared you the most or changed you the most where the paranormal world is uh, concerned, Richard. Well, like I said, first, the, the house that I grew up in. Right. I mean, that, that made me a believer. It actually whetted my appetite enough so I could just delve into it. Um, and then over the years, like I said, we, we did some investigations of 
Point Pleasant and the Mothman. We got to, um, over the years, between West Virginia and Kentucky. Mm. Uh, so I have seen things. I think oh. the scariest thing. I was just going to say. Probably be the EVP I mentioned. Oh. I sure. But there's a place called the Farnsworth Inn up in Gettysburg. We had gone there, and there was a room, and there was really nobody in the uh, Farnsworth Inn in that room. We were able, we were lucky enough to to get it. There was a last-minute cancellation. But when we went there, we heard a cat. And, okay, fine, it's, it's a bed and breakfast. Uh, it's a cat. And the room we went into actually smelled of roses. Okay, it's oh. book three, it's a candle. But when we went and spoke to the owner, there, it was used as pretty much a, a um, hospital in the birthing area. Now, hmm. the cat that we heard, she told us, was actually probably the sounds of babies crying. Oh, my God. That that was a bit... That's like the most that frightening. Was, that's, I think that would scare me. <laughs> the and, most. And, and that's where I was going to go next, honestly and truly. I wanted to ask you how many of the, you know, I'm going to use a term that was used decades ago when that's insane asylum, mental institutions and that sort of thing, um, especially when you're talking about the children's wards in those places. Have you investigated some of those as well? Not very often, no. Yeah, um, that, they creep me have, out. They're people just like we are. Just, well, they were people too. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I'm not afraid of anything like that. It's just, I just look at things a little bit differently. They're, hmm. they're pretty much like us. You're going to have good ones. You're going to have bad ones. So usually the ones that are probably the youngest, mm-hmm. they're probably the most frightened if they are spirits rather than, than ghosts. ghosts. Hmm. They're probably as frightened, if not more frightened than we are. You know, so that's, I, that's just my I take on it. Well, every ghost I've ever seen, I'm just now having this realization as we're talking, every ghost that I have seen and everyone in my family that has seen one, because we're a whole chain of really weird people. Yeah. Um, but, well, we and, tell. Yeah, it, it shows. Take that definite compliment, too. Yeah, thank, thank you. Right. Yeah, I wear it well. And, uh, and yeah. so I have noticed that every ghost that I have seen has never seen me. Hmm. But ever and it has not also not seen my mom or my brother or my grandmother, and they'll walk through a wall or something because they're seeing their world like they saw it when they were in it. I think they sense us or sensed me and sensed them, but didn't see us. I could see it, but I could see that it didn't see me, and it was just going about its business as if I weren't there. Hmm. But spirits are like, hey there, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. You ever, I think it's, it's a movie from a while back. I think it had Nicole Kidman in it. Oh, the others! <laughs> that was very that, Oprah. Did you like that's that? What I'm <laughs> that's the perspective like that I. Movie. That's how I look at it when I do an investigation. Yeah, uh, and Richard, I swear, I'm, I'm, I'm not dominating. I promise I'm not. But this is a true story. <laughs> David Tillman and I. He's my friend. He's psychic, and uh, he said I won't. Uh, I did not know he was going to bring this movie over. And so I did. I knew nothing about it. So I ran out and got a movie, got some dessert so that we'd have something sweet to eat after we had dinner and we could watch his movie, right? So I ran to Blockbuster. Yep. That's when they had a Blockbuster. <laughs> and I ran all the way around the wall on the new releases, and there was only one copy of The Others left. So I grabbed it, not knowing anything about it because I was in a hurry, came back home, <laughs> showed it to David, and David's like, oh, my God, that's the movie I was going to bring, and my blockbuster was out. So we do dinner. We have dessert. We're sitting on the sofa. We're watching the others. It's almost 1 o'clock at night at this point. All of the lights are off in the house. Oh and by God. the way, I lived in a house. Tony, you've been there. It had two ghosts in oh, it for yeah. 15 years. We're watching this movie. And at the very last clip where everything goes to black, true story, every 
thing went black on our entire block. The street lights went out. The oven <laughs> went off. The microwave went dead. That's the clocks hilarious. were flashing on and off, and it was like that. And the last thing I saw was David's face going, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and then everything goes, because it flickered and went dead, and we had just literally watched the last oh breath of the others. <laughs> Well, that's a message. I know. <laughs> uh, that's more like a. a Your neighbors a are mad at you. Tink, tinkle down the the leg. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, Try to piss up a rope. Man. I know, was, right? Oh. Well, you hey. You got the director's cut, didn't you? I, I did what? You got the director's cut of the movie. Didn't <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> right. Oh, it was it was crazy good. So I love you using that as an analogy for the go the difference between the yeah. ghost and the spirits and connection. I love that. It's the, you, it, here, and I think what one thing that I want to talk about too is you know the plantations. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this with uh, Jeff and about you know uh, battlefields and civil you know the Civil War and all this stuff. Plantations. Uh, why do you think plantations are are so well known for hauntings and and uh, I guess maybe it's just because it's old homes. But, but why do you think they're they're so haunted and why do you think these ghosts stick around in a lot of the plantations? Well, I think there's two main reasons. Now, first of all, there's a great emotional connection to it, and usually if there's a place that's got mm-hmm. an emotional connection, people are going to be staying. People are going to be staying around. They're going to haunt the place. So think about it. Plantation owners, their families, they had a sense of pride with it. Um, right. Slaves oftentimes have a strong connection to it, not so much in a positive way. And also, a lot of the plantation houses during the Civil War were taken over and used as field hospitals. Mm. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of emotional connection with that. So if you can have, if you can think about it, you've got, you would have ghosts or or spirits of the slaves, the plantation owners, and soldiers all at the same time. Now, do you think these are more imprints, or do you think these are more spirits? Some of both. A little bit of both? uh, I think mostly it would be the impressions or the ghosts. I think in some cases it, in fact, would be the spirits. Mm Mm-hmm. and also, there was a high mortality rate. Just but that's slowly, right. well, it's connected to the emotional aspect. But you know, the well, the medicine was not as advanced as it is today. Right. You lived past the age of forty. You were considered an old man. Okay. So that's something to be taken. <laughs> Tony, you're ancient. I'm, I'm an old. <laughs> <laughs> Just call that's me Tales of the Crypt, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. The, it wasn't uncommon for for parents to have more than one child that wouldn't live two or three years. Right. So there's a high mortality rate in that regard, and also simply because some of the plantation sites, there were battlefields. Mm. So you've got soldiers that are dying, you know, by the hundreds, in some cases by the thousands. Now, so those are the two... Those are the two main reasons, the emotional connection and the high mortality rate associated with, with the plantation. Well, one thing, one thing that, I, that I find fascinating about, you know, especially what you have written, was uh, Haunted Route 66. Now, the, you know, everybody, everybody seems to know Route 66. You know, it's one of the legendary highways starting in Chicago and comes out here to, uh, to Santa Monica, California. And uh, what, what made you want to write about this highway what what was what was is there a fascination for it or just it, it's it's a sense of americana it is who mm. we are it's what what america was about it represents ingenuity it is just it's just absolutely just hearing the people talk about the individual um well the way it worked the individual uh cases the individual places um the way Route 66 works, it was before the, the interstate highway system. Um, right. They call it Main Street USA because, in fact, it was, it went through many towns. It went through Main Street. And whenever people in these towns decided, they realized that more traffic was coming through, they decided to make their towns unique and original. That's why we've, we've got some of the most amazing, amazing stops and restaurants and 
and just sights along Route 66. That, that's why I like it. So it represents us as Americans. It represents us as being creative and so on and so forth. But it also, going back to my statement before, there's also a strong emotional connection to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and do you, it do you, will lead to the ghost seat. But do you think, okay, do you think um, Route 66, so many towns, once the, 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 the highways, the freeways and the interstates were built, Route 66, many of the towns pretty much died away. A lot of them did anyway. Uh, do you think, like, people, can towns have imprint? Can it... I think so. That makes sense. But I think they can. Yeah, because so I, I would it... find that fascinating to to think about that. Now, what did you travel along this, this route and uh, take your time? How long did it take you to research this? Oh, well, I did research by calling individuals. I ended up emailing several, um, doing research online, just going to old school by actually going to the library and finding books on it. Um, and a whole number of different ways. I didn't necessarily rely on one research technique. Mm. I think that that would limit me. Um, but we drove it. Um, gosh, last year we drove it in 10 days. Wow. Mm. Wow. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. When you, when you say I'm we, eight. who was it? You and who else? And my wife. Oh, there you go. <laughs> She's like, oh, you ain't going without me. I yeah, love right? that. Now, yeah. what, <laughs> so what? What is one of the most haunted places along Route sixty six? Oh man, I don't think I can limit myself to one. <laughs> I would. Well, give us several or a few. Oh, there are just so many of them in the book. There's over a hundred. Wow. There's over a hundred listings, but I'd say if I had to choose one that would be a favorite of mine, I would have to say there is, oh, let's see, a place called the Beaumont Hotel. Well, the reason I even is mention that, that is because... No. Where is that? Well, I'll choose a different one. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Now, the reason I even say this is because when I wrote the book, I tried to do a chapter for each of the states that Route 66 passed through. Right. Some of the, um, some of the states had several hundred miles. Other states, less than 20. Oh, wow. So, now, I'm sure you've heard of Al Capone, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's just start at the beginning of Chicago. Um, there's a place called the SMC Cartage Company. Yes. That to me, yeah, that's whenever, well, that's whenever we had, um, oh gosh, I'm just trying to think what had happened. I'm just looking through this. Um, we got this, we've got, um, gee, people that were associated with Capone. On February 14th, 1929, we had the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, oh, yeah. And you're familiar with that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Several people from the mafia were lined up against the wall. They were shot, and and really none of them survived. And after that, we started hearing of recordings of the machine, of the gunfire, of oh. people screaming. And ironically, what had happened too was that the brick wall behind, you know, that the men were lined up against. Right. People started to sell the bricks. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh hell no! Why would you? Why oh would yeah, you? and People sometimes according to legends, and I did not end. It, I did not personally verify this, but I would love to have one of those bricks. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes there were reports of sounds and apparitions associated with that. Mm. So that's mm-hmm. one of my mm-hmm. favorites. But I was just glancing through the book because. There's just so many different places that I've written about. So different radio shows, I'd probably say, you know, I've mentioned, I've mentioned different locations. But I wanted to try something different. And looking through, I think one of my favorites would be the location of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Now, where was the Belmont Hotel? I forgot. I first... Oh, well, the reason I even mentioned that was the Belmont Hotel... Oh, bear with me. I want to make sure I get all of the information 
mm-hmm. correctly, okay? Okay. Uh, bear with me on this. It's okay. And That's if you're right. just tuning in, you're listening to On Air with Tony Sweet's Truth Be Told. I'm Eddie Connor. I'm Tony Sweet. Demona Hoffman. And we have Richard Southall on the phone. He's going to be talking to us even more about haunted places along Route 66. He's talked to us a little bit about some of these haunted plantations, and he's pulling up something about the Belmont right now, which I think is going to make it even more fun. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm sure people listening have had, somebody's had some experiences. I would love to hear (gasps) what... What a great show. Yeah, what people, what's been going on for people. They can tell us on the chat roll. Yeah, they can join the chat roll. Tony and I are both in there right now, and I'll be Eddie's proxy here. (laughs) But if you've had a paranormal experience, jump in there. We want to hear your experience. And if you have questions for Richard, why not? We love that. Send them our way. Now, okay. Or can you hear me? Are you there? Oh, yeah, we're here. We're here. Houston, we're here. (laughs) Now, <laughs> what's that? I said Houston, now, we're here. So much <laughs> well, wh- the reason I even kind of hesitated with the Beaumont Hotel was simply because it was in Kansas. In Kansas, oh it doesn't you don't necessarily have a lot of Route 66 going I don't think, I, what's as funny is Belmont is not on Route 66 because I'm from Kansas. It that's is why not. It, that's why it threw me off a little it bit. Is, but now, it is one. It's, it's known in Kansas as a very haunted hotel. It's been there for a long time, uh, at least a hundred years. Okay. I did include the Beaumont in the book because I was kind of looking at Route sixty six, the book, as like a tour guide, so to speak. If right. somebody wanted to learn about a place sense. that was haunted, and well, honestly, Kansas only had thirteen miles of Route sixty six going through it. So mm-hmm. here I have other states that would have several hundred miles. Say, let's see, New Mexico had nearly 500. Illinois had 305. Yeah. And then we got mm-hmm. then we got Kansas with 13 miles. Wow! Didn't really do <laughs> Lucky a full 13. chapter yeah. on 13 miles mm-hmm. of Route 66. Well, and I so what I did. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, no, I finish. I, I have another question after that. I'm just <laughs> I'm getting excited. <laughs> okay. But that's why I did that. I wanted to, I also did this with Texas, but I made it within a three-hour drive of Route 66. So the Beaumont Hotel is about two and a half hours. I was thinking if somebody was traveling Route 66 and they wanted to make a day of it or make it of going to any of these locations, I wanted to make it worth their while. That makes so, total sense. If that mm-hmm. answers any questions. So, Richard, you know, one, one very common ghost story is the hitchhiking ghost. Oh, yeah. And so I imagine being on a place where there's a lot of people that are transitioning from place to place, there must have been some stories that came up of hitchhiking ghosts. Maybe you Ooh, and your wife picked one up yeah. along the way. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Um, what we've got is... We've got Rose Hill Cemetery. Have you heard of it? I've heard of it, but I, I but it's just vague. I have heard of it. Okay. Well, there's a cemetery associated with um, that is in Illinois, and mm-hmm. there have been cases where, outside the cemetery, there has been a woman seen a hitchhiking. Hmm. Now, somebody, of course, according to legend, somebody would pick her up. She would tell where she needed to go, and when we get to the location, she's missing. She's gone. Yeah. That, to me, I think would be more of a folktale or a legend. Now, a lot of the times, yes, does that happen? I have no doubt that it happens, but we tell the story. We, in most every major metropolitan area, or actually many towns throughout the nation, will have a variation of that story. And I think that we're going to have the Phantom Hitchhiker all along Route 66, which I've heard several stories about that. But you know, it's it's hard to sometimes distinguish urban legend from actual paranormal activity. Mm-hmm. And that's that's another reason that I think it's crucial to to do some investigation even before you go to a site. And Richard, we have about five minutes left, but uh, before we ask uh, you how we can get in touch with you and Tony and Demona's listeners can also get in touch with you on social networks and pick up your books and that that sort of thing, I would be curious, is there one 
haunted location that you've heard about or that you know about that you absolutely would not spend the night there by yourself? Oh, mm. no, just tell me a place and I'll go there. <laughs> wow, it's that's not amazing. Thinking about it, but the scarier, I, I, the more intriguing it is to me. So maybe famous last words, but I, <laughs> I'd love to go. So, well, well, to set us up for another another go around with you here in the future, I I know that you're a Freemason, and I and I yeah. and I want to give a little teaser of, of, of you know because when you say Freemason, people in this country instantly go to conspiracy theory, and in uh, all the secrets, <laughs> yeah, all the secrets of of you know of taking over the world, you know they so. Give us a little, just a brief little summary of what Freemason is to you as a Freemason. Oh, I'm very limited on what I can say about that. I'm, oh, see? I'm That's see? what a <laughs> Freemason would say. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a brotherhood. It's basically something that would bring men from all, all walks of life together. It gives us a different... A way of looking at things, of, of treating people, of respecting people. It is a fraternity, and it goes much deeper than a, a single one or even two hour show could could even scratch right. the surface. So, so it, okay, and so this is an innocent question. So I'm hearing you say brotherhood. I'm hearing you say fraternity. What about women uh, in association with Freemasonry? The there's something called the Eastern Star. Yeah, that is equivalent to that but <clears throat> freemasonry at this point it's for men only it okay. goes all the way back to hundreds of years yeah and i you know we've talked to you know bob hieronymus yep. on our show before and again he he's you know he's part of the freemasons mm -hmm. and he, i think he said in his uh lodge i think that they they do have some women that are part of it but he said it's very very limited hmm. that there's ever women to be a part of it um as as a brotherhood, and, and you know, and there's a lot of the the traditions. I'm going to call them traditions, and of the handshakes and the and the symbols. Uh, I would love to have you come back because we never really got to go into the symbols and even what they mean. I don't know, you know, if you know much. I'm sure you do as a Freemason, but because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know, you know, the dollar bill. Um, there's in Washington D.C. Many of those symbols are Freemason symbols. And hidden messages. And, uh, yeah, and so I would love to have you back uh, to, and and talk about the symbols and what they mean, and you know, not maybe not not give anything away, not give anything away, but, but help educate some people. Educate, yes. <laughs> would you be willing to do that? I've used that word several times. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, well, but we want to thank you so much for being here to uh, today, uh, Richard. And uh, if you guys uh, just tuned in and you uh, are interested in in the paranormal, ghost, ghost hunting, uh, go to Amazon. You can pick up uh, his books. Uh, Richard Southall, Haunted Route 66, is one of his books, and also How to Be a Ghost Hunter. So, this these are two books that you can go pick up. Is there any new books coming out that uh, you can share with us? Haunted Plantations of the South is going to be coming out in spring of 2015. Also, I've completed a, a work of nonfiction, a, a work of fiction, excuse me. I just haven't uh, had a chance to, to publish it yet. So oh, we've got awesome, at least awesome. two new titles coming from me. And uh, do you have any uh, social medias that we could share with our audience? Well, with my work schedule, I hardly have a chance to do Facebook or Twitter. But somebody wants to get a hold of me. There are two email addresses. One's hauntedplantations at gmail dot com. Oh, great, great, so, great email. And another one's Route sixty six ghost book at gmail dot com. I created a separate email for each of the books. Oh, very that is good. so great. Well, Richard, thank you so much. You promised to come back. I'd be happy to. Thank All you right. for having me. I really. Okay. I've really enjoyed myself. Well, we've learned a lot, and I'm going to, Eddie and I and Demona, we're going to go start becoming ghost hunters. Yeah, we're going to the <laughs> Beaumont tomorrow. <laughs> we're going to no, have some spirits, yeah. drink some spirits. We're going to need them. Yeah. We're going to need them. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. We'll talk Sounds to you later. Thanks, Richard. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
All right, everybody, it is time to say goodbye. Demona, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. It's my pleasure. Uh, time. Oh, and I'm always up for talking ghosts. Right? Yeah. right. And if you guys uh, need some dating advice, especially online dating, go mm -hmm. on Wednesdays right here on UBN at 11 a.m. Uh, Channel One, Dates and Mates. Uh, Demona is the lady to go to. What's the book's name, your book? Spin Your Web, Spin. How to Brand Yourself for Successful Online Dating. But there's much, much more at datesandmates.com. That's my website. And I have literally like hundreds of articles that I've written on online and offline dating. It has nothing to do with paranormal. Right. This is just my passion, <laughs> but that is my business. And so if anyone's single that's listening, and sometimes I'd love to meet it's up as scary either. as it is. Paranormal. Yeah, very frightening, <laughs> it's especially funny. this time of year. And Eddie, thank you so much as always. You're, so, you're so amazing. And uh, you're back next Friday for yes. our Halloween show. That's right. We have a round table of pretty much anything paranormal you can think of. That's Wicca, right. witch, uh, voodoo, Hi, I might priestess. stop in for that too. Yeah, we have to. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. All right. Well, we love you guys. Stick around for four tools in a box with Jeff Timmons love right that. after this. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Have a great, great weekend. Bye, y'all. This has been on air with Tony Sweet. Don't worry. There's more online. Search on air with Tony Sweet on iTunes for fast shows and exclusive behind the scenes content. On air with Tony Sweet every Wednesday and Friday from four to six p.m. Pacific, right here on UBNRadio.com.